Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Assalamu alaikum and hi everyone I am Dr. Kamran Sattar and today together we will learn about tips and tricks on writing scoping review paper what why and how these three questions are the best friend of every researcher and knowing the answer to these three mean you are more likely to be engaged, show more initiative, and have greater understanding of the end goal. This also helps um, for you to guard you against over or under workup, prevents uh, unnecessary work, and helps manage all aspects professionally and meaningfully. We believe at the end of today's session, we all together will be able to describe what is a scoping review? Explain the main reasons as to why to do a scoping review. And last but not the least, designate the fundamental elements of how to do a scoping review. There are various types of knowledge synthesis tools. We do not need to go into detail about all types mentioned here because our focus today is on scoping reviews. And we know that according to the Kandyan Institute of Health Research, scoping reviews are exploratory projects that systematically map the literature available on a topic, identifying key concepts, theories, sources of evidence, and gaps in the research. Without going into detail of all knowledge synthesis tools or the type of reviews, I believe it is still essential to know the basic differences because it can help you see what actually you need to target and work on, what not to do in order to strive for your goal, and even sort out different steps of processes about how to achieve your objectives. When the time is of essence, you shall go for a rapid review, which is a form of evidence synthesis that may provide more timely information for decision making compared with the standard systematic reviews. And if your goal is to measure intervention effectiveness, you must start working on a systematic review, which attempts to collate and collect empirical evidence from a relatively smaller number of studies pertaining to a particular focused research question. But if your target is to have an overview of a broader field, the scoping review is the solution, simply because it seeks to present an overview of a potentially large and diverse body of literature pertaining to a broad, broader topic. Scoping reviews are still a new domain to be explored. But the first article came out in 1997. But this slide shows here the most prominent works done so far by the expert whom the researcher worldwide follow. Because these prominent works have given us famous methodologies and frameworks to conduct scoping reviews. We see that the number of scoping reviews papers has risen exponentially and that is because of their usefulness. When you are going to embark or look at a topic with which you are not familiar with or if there has not been much written on it or published on it and has not really been explored before, then this is the time for you to start working on a scoping review. From this graph, it is evident and obvious that the scoping reviews have become an increasingly popular approach for synthesizing research evidence and their number has increased in the last 8 to 10 years. Basically, scoping review is a recent model that aims to answer broad questions and identify and expose the available evidence of a broader question, being a rigorous and reproducible method. It is a relatively new approach for which a universally accepted study definition or a definitive procedure has not been established yet. But in the last two decades, researchers have discussed the most appropriate methods to carry out scoping reviews. And recently, PRISMA, which is preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis for scoping reviews, has reported and published their guidelines.
We all know that basically scoping reviews are used to identify knowledge gaps, set research agendas, and ident identify implications for decision making, and hence help us to lead to an answer the very important question such as what information has been presented on the topic so far in the literature. In this slide, we can see an example on the right hand side of the aim of the scoping review conducted by our team and published in a well reputable and indexed journal. Now, at this level, you have to ask yourself if your goal is to help, help to clarify working definitions and conceptual boundaries of a topic or when a body of literature that you are working on has not been yet comprehensively reviewed or exhibits a large, complex or heterogeneous nature, then yes, certainly you have to conduct a scoping review. So this slide provides guidance and shows an example of how did we match our research dynamics while we had undertaken one of our scoping reviews published in 2022 with the four reasons identified by RCC in 2005 for conducting a scoping review. Reason one is working definitions. So we aimed at finding qualities of medical professionalism frequently highlighted in the literature across the globe. And our research question was what have frequently been highlighted as the essential attributes of medical professionalism in an undergraduate medical education context. Reason number two large and complex body of literature. So we all know as a research gap or we may call it unavailability of universally agreed attributes related to medical professionalism. Reason number three, heterogeneous nature. A diverse range of interests of various stakeholders, as we all know, regarding medical professionalism literature suggests it is a tripod of individual, interpersonal and societal contexts. Reason four, before a full systematic review. For our future perspective as Mao, we intend to carry out a full systematic review. So we had in mind all these four reasons and particularly we had to answer, we have to tackle these four reasons and that has led us towards scoping review. Axie Anomaly has provided an explicit step-by-step -step guidance as a methodological framework for scoping reviews, which we had adopted for our all scoping reviews published so far. In this slide, we explain with examples from our personal experience as what did we do at every stage. For instance, at stage number one, which is about identifying the research question, this being the most important element of our, of our scoping reviews, as concerns with the issues in which the research is to be taken place. For instance, the research question for our one of our scope review was what are common coping strategies used by medical students in undergraduate medical education context? State two, identifying relevant studies. What we did was employed a three step search. First, a primary search through Google Scholar, Puppet and Scopus, which was commenced in April 2021 and the authors conducted out an evaluation of the content within the uh, listed uh, documents and, and their title and abstract and with the index terms used to assign related articles. Second, a search employing all the established keywords and index terms was commenced within all databases stated above. Third, the reference list of all participating studies was investigated for further studies. Stage three was about study selection. At this stage, our articles directly matching or similar to our mentioned keywords were recognized. And a three stage screening taken place for title, for abstract, and for full text. Moreover, the full content was looked at to determine fitness for inclusion. And at this stage, the collection method of full text articles was a accomplished by two researchers and a third researcher was available all the time to fix differences of opinion if found any. At stage number four, which is to chart the data, an example of how did it look like in our real work, we have kept a slide to be shown to you in the later part of our presentation. But here we just want to let you know that at this particular stage, we developed an initial 
or you may call it a provisional form to tabulate the relevant data from the included studies. Initially, randomly chosen articles were individually studied by two researchers who drafted the data abstraction form to ensure that their tactic for data extraction is constantly reliable and consistent with the research question. The final form involved headings such as study features, for example, year of publication and research focus area. At stage five, which is about collating, summarizing and reporting the results, at this particular stage, we were able to recognize thematic categories of the literature involving various segments, comprising methods, evidence, defining results and implications. Once all the data were assembled and some opening information had been recognized, a detailed meeting between the authors was held to discuss the data analysis, strategy, interpretation, discussion and writing of this particular manuscript for publication. Data analysis basically mainly involved qualitative thematic analysis. Stage six, which is an optional stage, it is about consultation. While ongoing consultation may occur in other all types of studies or reviews, providing expertise, context, and interpretation, the consultation phase in scoping the studies is viewed or considered as a formalized and distinct phase, which involves key informants and or stakeholders with expertise in the field of inquiry. The consultation phase in scoping studies, if undertaken, requires formal recruitment, data collection, qualitative approaches to analysis and interpretation and ethics board review. Alternatively, consultation is a formal stage of the Arxi and Ovalis framework, whereby experts and key informants are formally consulted on the results of the literature review and provide further insight into experiential evidence, interpret what is found in the literature strengths and gaps, and provide recommendations for moving forward. Once you have made up your mind to start on a scoping review, simply remember that a scoping review is not necessarily less work than a systematic review. Moreover, always avoid using negative rationale. And last but not the least, always check if similar work has ever been done by anyone else, anywhere else across the, the globe, so that you do not fall into a trap in reinventing the wheel. In this slide and the slides onward, we will discuss some tips which shall work for beginners as a guide and, and shall let experts as well as, as a reminder of what to look for if uh, anybody has decided to do a scoping review. Develop a pilot scoping review. Piloting the process for study selection and data extraction can help to ensure universal understanding of the construct of instruct, interest, study selection criteria and characteristics of interest for extraction among members of the team. Why to have a protocol? Answer is, as the protocol is the plan or methodology of your scoping review, you need to develop your protocol at the beginning of the process before you start your searches. You may refine your protocol as you progress through your review. The iterative nature of a scoping review may necessitate some changes, which you have to mention later on. Protocol content, according to the JBI, manual, which is Jonah Biggs Institute manual for evidence synthesis in their chapter 11.2, which is about development of a scoping review protocol. It is stated that a scoping review protocol is important as it predefines the objectives, methods and reporting of the review and also allows for transparency of the process. The protocol should detail the criteria that the reviewers intend to use to include and exclude sources of evidence and to identify what data is relevant and how the data will be extracted. The protocol provides the plan for the scoping review and it's important in limiting the occurrence of reporting bias. Any deviations of the scoping review from the protocol should be clearly highlighted and explained in the scoping review. Now, the most important question, where to register your protocol? JBI reviews can get registered via JBI systematic review register. 
On the other hand, non-JBI reviews can be registered via an open research repository such as Open Science Framework and Fiction. By the way, Open Science Framework is also recommended by Prisma. Please note that Prospero accepts registrations for systematic reviews, rapid reviews, and umbrella reviews, but Prospero does not accept scoping reviews or literature scans. It is recommended to keep the term scoping review in your title. On the right hand side, it's an example of our scoping review. Our title was a, a scoping review on frequently highlighted most important attributes of medical professionalism in an undergraduate medical education context. It is again also recommended to use PCC mnemonic. In our example, you can use, you can see that we have kept population as a medical student, concept as their attitude, behavior, professionalism, and context as undergraduate. Making your research work reproducible is a must, and for that you must describe it in an explicit way. Here you can take guidance from our personal experience of conducting a robust search during one of the, our one of our published scoping reviews. At this stage of our presentation, few of you might have started thinking that searching the literature could be an impregnable task making you restless. But thanks to the available tools, which surely will make your life easy, it might take some time for you to get familiarized with, but once you know how to use these tools, you will feel you are in heaven. For instance, we have general tools like Covidence, Distiller SR, Revman Cochrane, EPPI Reviewer, Early Review Organizing, Software, EROS, Eros. We have citation managers, for example, EndNote, Mendeley, and we have tools for meta-analysis as well, with the names like Distiller SR, Forest Plot, Forest Plot Generator from Evidence Partner, Revman, the Cochrane, and Open Meta Analyst. Useful tools also include and are very much recommended, like Prisma Flow Diagram and Prisma Checklist. Prisma stands for Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta Analysis. Kindly find link for these full documents in the reference list at the end of this presentation. Most of the searches initially yielded a very large or extremely huge number of documents in our own scoping review, but with your screening process, you may further refine and at last get few studies to be included, the relevant studies to be included in your actual scoping review. And at this stage, Prisma comes in very handy. When it comes to adding your inclusion and exclusion criteria, you have to be very clear and explicit and have full details. On the right hand side, this is an example of how explicitly we had formulated the inclusion and exclusion criteria while doing one of our scoping review, which has already been published. The typical process of identifying eligible studies begins with screening abstracts. Initially, you have a large number of documents which are further reviewed again and again, and later you are left with fewer but important and relevant documents to be included in your scoping review. To accomplish this important task, what we had done, we had three step plan. First, our abstract screening was based on the inclusion exclusion criteria and the pilot study. Secondly, two reviewers independently carried out the screening for titles and abstracts. Last but not least, with an exclusive screening, the documents which were not in which are not consistent with predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria were removed.
This is again a very important slide showing what to avoid and what not to miss. On the right hand side, it is shown that we piloted with 10 randomly selected articles at the beginning. And two researchers worked towards enlisting abstraction form for the data independently. We listed, refined, and defined all our variables, which was professionalism attributes. For scoping reviews, extracting the data is referred to as charting the data. And the goal with charting is to create a descriptive summary of the results, which address which addresses the scoping review's objectives and answers the research question of the review. Key information is to look for and not to miss any important thing. Always present results in diagrammatic or tabular form, which, which, which could be done in a numerical summary form as well, and or in a descriptive format or a narrative summary that aligns with the study objectives and scope of the review. Always make sure outcomes are truly consistent with the purpose and always use Prisma flow diagram. This is an interesting finding by Trico et al. in 2016 that in most cases the results of the scoping review were used to identify evidence gaps at 85%, provide recommendations for future research as 84% or identify strengths and limitations as 69%. You have to state your limitations and challenges. The most frequent limitations so far reported in the reviews in the available literature was possibility that the review may have missed some relevant studies. And the same time, if you are getting tired of trying, keep trying to say yourself, keep telling yourself you didn't come this far to quit. Publishing your work again is very important and for this particular topic we have to, we have to, to, to be again sitting together in another video in next presentation. Scoping review steps, these are simple steps that if followed shall pave the path for you to successfully conduct a scoping review. During the time spent in my journey for scoping reviews, I have learned that even the small steps can get to you to, to get you to your big goals. What I do is that I always break down big tasks into smaller tasks and keep a record of my progress and I'm ready to modify if needed. But you have to be consistent and as always quoted by a well-known well -known medical educationist and my mentor, Dr. Mohammed Saif Bar Yusuf from Malaysia. He always mentions, no matter what speed you opt for, but the important thing is to keep moving. For your understanding, I will repeat the steps. So first step was that we decided our topic. Second step is to develop a research question with the help of PCC framework. Third, inclusion and excluding criteria. Once we are done with the criteria, then apply these inclusion student criteria to our data search. With our data search completed, we have to look for duplicates and remove them. The next step will be, of course, be the screening in two steps. First, we screen the title and abstract, and then we screen for full text. But remember, no quality appraisal is to be done. Remember, it is optional. Sometimes you may do it, but it's not a mandatory requirement. The next thing is extraction and writing. These are simple steps to be done while writing a scoping review. One last thing you need to remember is to make sure that while doing this process, you should use the Prisma checklist. This checklist will guide you and help you from beginning to end. end. And without this checklist, you may compromise the quality of your scoping review. This important slide depicts the available meritorious and exemplary work done by the experts in the field and their work is undoubtedly worth reading and following. Take home message for today's presentation is do not reinvent the wheel, instead make it better. 
This slide shows the references for your further reading. And here with this slide, we end our today's presentation. I hope you all have enjoyed it. And if you like to discuss anything related to scoping review in more detail, kindly feel free to contact me. Goodbye for now and hope to see you again in another exciting and educational video. Thank you so much.